Let's learn CQRS and .NET Core. Hey guys, what is up? My name is Jono. If you guys want to jump straight into the code, go to this timestamp here. All the code for this video will be in my GitHub repository, link in the description below, so you guys can go check that out as well. Let's get into it. So what is CQRS? In simple terms, CQRS just stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation. And what that means is just separating your reads from your writes. So this is probably best explained with a diagram. So if we have a look at this diagram, when a GET request comes in, that's classified as a query. So that's gonna go down one application path, that's gonna go down our query application path. And then when something like a put request, a post request, or a delete request comes in, that's classified as a command because that's gonna be mutating data. So the main purpose behind CQRS is being able to separate your read logic from your write logic and having them being able to evolve independently without impacting one another. So why should you use CQRS? So this is gonna be my personal opinion. I believe it helps me follow the single responsibility principle just because we're separating our reads from our writes and it makes things independent. So this also has another positive as well is all our changes are gonna be isolated. So each query, each command, they're independent. If I change one query, it's not gonna affect other queries or other commands. It's all the changes to that query are gonna be isolated and it makes changes a lot easier. So when should you use CQRS? Straight off the bat, CQRS isn't gonna be a silver bullet. It's not gonna solve all your problems. It's just gonna be another tool in your toolbox. But when should you use it? In my opinion, if your application's changing pretty frequently, CQRS is probably a good option because those changes are isolated and you can update independent queries and commands without affecting one another. Another use case for CQRS is when your application is very read heavy. When you're using CQRS, you can actually split your databases up into a read database and a write database. So you can scale them independently and actually model them independently as well. So your read database could be modeled to be as efficient as possible for queries, whereas your write database might be fully normalized, have no duplicated data in order to be as accurate as possible. That does bring extra complexities because you need to keep these two databases in sync. We're not gonna be covering that in this video, but you do have to be aware of it. So now that I've tried my best to explain CQRS using words, let's jump into the code and hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense. Okay, so we're in Visual Studio and I've just started up a new web API project using .NET 5. So I have made a little bit of a change uh, just to get things up and running, uh, just because we're not gonna be covering this in the video. So I just wanna go through a quick overview of what I've done. So I've added a repository to uh, our dependency injection container. And our repository is just a simple list of to-do items. And then we have to-do items. So these to-do items here, it's just ID, name completed, and that's all that I've done. So nice and simple, it's just a, a dummy database and a domain model. So let's get into the CQRS portion of things. In order to do CQRS, we're going to be using a, a library called Mediator. So what we're going to do is go to our NuGet packages and actually install Mediator. So what we are going to be searching for is Mediator. So we're gonna be installing this one here. So we're also gonna be installing this extensions.microsoft.dependency injection so we can add it to our dependency injection container later on. So we have our libraries installed. Now let's actually start with queries. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a folder called queries. So we've created our folder called queries, and now I'm going to create a class for getting a to-do item. So let's call this get to do by ID. Okay, so before we actually jump into the code, I wanna give you the three building blocks for both queries and commands. We first have a query or a command. We have a handler and we have a response. So what are these three things? A query slash command. This is going to be all the data that we need to execute the query or command. And what is a handler? A handler is all the business logic to execute the command or query, and it's going to return a response. What is a response? A response is essentially the data that we want to return. So these three things are the building blocks for both your queries and commands. And these are gonna be, you're gonna see this in pretty much every single one of your query and commands. Now that I've given you the building blocks, I wanna give you some sort of best practices that I think are gonna help you out in the long term. So my first recommendation is to actually make this a static class. So this static class is actually gonna be a container and it's gonna hold all your, it's gonna hold your query, your handler and your response internally. My next recommendation is that query commands and responses should all be records. A record is a new feature introduced in C-sharp 9, and since we're using .NET 5, we have access to records. And the benefit of using records is that they're immutable. So whenever a query command or a response is created, it can't be mutated at all. And that's what we want. These queries, commands, and responses, they should be immutable. They should just be data transfer objects and shouldn't be changing randomly throughout the application. Once they're created, they're created and they're not gonna be changed. This also has an added benefit of just writing less code as well. So 
if I want to do my query, so it'll be a public record query, and it'll just be an int ID. And if we compare this to a class, it's a lot less code. So public class query and int ID, and we're just going to need a, a getter. So you can see it's gone from one line of code to three lines of code. So using this record can actually reduce our file size and it just makes it a bit more readable as well. Now that I've given you my recommendations, now let's actually start getting into the CQRS portion of things. So we have our query. This, we now need to change this up a little bit. So this is where Mediator comes in. So this uh, query also needs to implement an iRequest interface. This is gonna come from Mediator and it needs to return a response. So this is just gonna be a placeholder here. So again, I will create my response record. Record response. And this is going to have an uh, int ID, string name, and then a bool completed. Cool. So we now have a query, we now have a response. Now it's actually time to implement our handler. So we create a class called handler, and this handler will actually implement an I request handler interface. So this request handler will take in the query and return the response. So then it's gonna to complain to us, say that we need to implement the interface. So we will do that. And it actually gives, a, it gives us a handle method. So this handle method is where all of the business logic will lie. So one great thing about using these handles is it actually allows you to use dependency injection. So in order to get our, our to-do item out of our database, we're gonna need access to our database. So I can just create a constructor here and I can just inject my repository into our constructor and .NET Core's dependency injection framework will handle all this stuff for me. So now it's actually time to start implementing our business logic. So essentially what we need to do is we need to get our to-do item. So we go var to-do, and we're going to be accessing our repository to-dos, and we're doing uh, first or default, and we're gonna be searching for where x.id is equal to the request.id. This should find our to-do. I'm just gonna make this async for the time being, just so it doesn't complain to us that we're not doing task.from result. So if our to-do uh, is null, then we just want to return null. Otherwise, we're going to return a new record or new response, sorry. And it's just going to map to our to-do item. So ID, to-do.name, and then to-do.completed. So we've now completed our, our query handler. So you're probably wondering, Okay, so how does this actually get called? We haven't created any controller or anything like that yet. So let's get into that now. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a controller inside of our controllers folder. And we're just gonna call this to do controller. Inside of this constructor, we need, to, we need access to this I mediator object. So this mediator object is again from the mediator package and it gives us access to a method called mediator.send. And this mediator.send method will take in a request object and it's going to return a response. So we have a request object. So I can do new, uh, what was it? Get to do by ID, by ID dot query. This is going to return a task of get to do by ID dot response. So with this mediator.send method, this is how we're actually going to be invoking all of these command handlers essentially. Okay, so now let's actually create our endpoint. So we're going to do public async task i action result. And it's this is going to be get to do by ID. And we're going to have our ID here. And we're just going to pass in our ID. All that we need to do is we're gonna have a response and we're going to call mediator.send and we're going to do our query. So get to do by ID dot query. And we're going to pass in our ID. Our response is going to be our get to do by ID dot response. And now we can return stuff. So I want to return uh, if uh, response is null, then we want to return not found. Otherwise we want to return okay 
and we want to return the response. That's essentially all that we really need. And as you can see, it's going to thin down our controllers a lot. So our controllers don't actually care what the implement implementation is. It only cares about, okay, here's the data going into the query and here's the data coming out of the query. And that's all it cares about. That's all it should care about. It doesn't have to care about all of the specific business logic, et cetera. It just needs to care about what data is going in, what data is coming out. So now that we have our query all set up, now let's actually test the application. Before we do that, we have to add one more line to our startup.cs to actually wire up all of our dependency injection. So what we're going to need is services.addmediator. So we have add mediator and this needs an assembly. So in order to do that, we can do type of startup.assembly. So essentially what this is going to do is it's going to scan the assembly of startup. So since all of our query and our commands are all within the same assembly, all of our, if I go back to our get to do by ID, all of our command handlers that implement this I request handler query response will be added to our dependency injection container. And that's going to allow this to happen, this dependency injection to happen. So since it's added to our container, it's then whenever it gets instantiated, it's going to be injected with all of its dependencies. Okay, so we have our application here, we have our Swagger UI. So if I put in ID one, we should get our, yep, we get our response body. Cook dinner, great. If I do ID two, should get another one, make YouTube video, great. If I add something that doesn't exist, I should get a not found. 404, not found, great. That's what we want, it's working. So now that you've seen how queries work, let's go through commands. So again, I'm going to create a folder called commands. And for this command, we're going to be creating a new to-do item. So let's do add new, or oh, add to-do. And I'm gonna be following my best practices again. So I'm gonna be doing static, I'm gonna be doing a static class. And I'm going to be creating uh, a query and a response, essentially. I'm going to be doing another record, public record uh, command. And this is going to contain a, a name. Great, and this is also going to implement our I request for mediator, and it's going to return a response. So what are we gonna return? We're just gonna return our ID, and that's gonna be an integer. So I can just say int, rather than actually creating a response object. Okay, so we have our command, and now we're just going to need our handler. So again, we're going to create a class handler and it's going to implement the I request handler interface and it's going to take in the command and it's going to return an integer response. So we're going to implement that interface and here we have our handle method again. So I'm just going to make this async just so I don't have to deal with the task.from result again. Again, I'm going to need access to our repository. So I will inject that into our handler. Okay, so we've injected our repository into our handler and now it's actually time to add our to-do item to our uh, to our database. So what I can do is I will just go repository.todos.add and we're gonna create a new to-do, to-do and our ID, I'm just gonna make this ID 10 and our name is going to be from our request.name and yep, completed can stay like that, that will automatically be false. Okay, and now I've just gotta return my ID. So I'm just hard coding these IDs in here just because obviously we don't have a database with auto incrementing identities or anything like that. So I'm just using this just as a demo just so you guys can understand um, the process of the commands and the query handlers, etc. Now let's actually add that to our controller. So if we go back to our controller and we create another endpoint, so this is gonna be a post, HTTP post, and it's just gonna be our uh, standard, um, standard route. And we're gonna do public async task again. And I'm going to do an I action result. And this is going to be a add to do. And this is going to take in add to do commands dot command. And essentially all we need to do is go return OK mediator dot send. And we're going to send the command to mediator. We should now be able to add a um, add a to do item to our database. Let's try it out. So let's do test one two three four five. Great. Execute. Yep, we got our we got our ID back of ten. So if I do this 
for 10, we should get test one, two, three, four, five. There we go. So we've been able to add that into our into our, our repository. So now that you've seen queries and commands, I actually wanted to backtrack a little bit and talk about the best practices that I mentioned. The reason why I recommended everything to be inside one file was purely because of the discoverability. So let's say hypothetical scenario, a brand new developer joins your team and they're going through the code base, trying to figure out what's what and follow along with the code. Imagine if you had your query, your handler and your response all in individual files. So the developer is gonna to have to jump around in all these different files to figure out what's what. And if it's not organized properly or if it's not organized together, then it's going to be hard to follow along with and it's gonna it's going to be a lot less efficient. But if I'm a brand new developer and I come into this controller and I'm trying to follow along what's what, I'll come into here and I'll be like, okay, mediator.send and get to do id.query. Okay, cool. So probably the first thing that I'm gonna do is going to navigate into this query and see what's actually going on. So I'm gonna hit F12 and it's gonna take me directly to my query. And there you go. I can see everything that I need to know about this query. I can see yeah, the data that we need to execute it. I can see the handler, which contains all the business logic and I can see the response as well. That's the reason why I've actually recommended to try and keep everything within the same file. It's just because it makes discoverability and being able to navigate the code a lot easier. Hope you guys have enjoyed the video. If you did like it, leave a like, comment and subscribe. And don't forget all the code for this video will be in my GitHub repository, link in the description below. Have a good one guys, see ya.